Hello, and welcome to another AAIS webinar. Today, we will be discussing California's mandatory wildfire mitigation credit regulation. I'm Robin Westcott, Vice President and General Counsel for AAIS. Also joining me today are my colleagues here at AAIS, including Linda Jancic, our Product Manager of Personal Lines, Mike Payne, our Chief Price and Actuary, and Matt Hines Aldridge, our Senior Risk Strategy Lead. Together, we'll be addressing how this new regulation has impacted our programs from both a product and actuarial perspective. As you can see from our agenda, the team will cover a brief overview of the regulation, the efforts that AAIS has undertaken to address changes to our insurance products, and an introduction of our efforts to align the insurance industry to support consumer information about wildfire mitigation. As with all industry meetings, we'll begin with the antitrust statement. Today's webinar will include an opportunity for you to submit questions regarding the content presented. As many of you on this call are competitors, we should always be mindful of the constraints of the antitrust laws. The full AAIS antitrust policy can be found at our website. And if you have any questions or concerns, please feel free to contact me. While we will talk about the regulation and implementation in the AAIS products, I'd really like to take this opportunity to emphasize the importance of the consumer information and the introduction of our consumer notice tool. As a former regulator in Florida, I can recall the move to incorporate wind mitigation factors into insurance rates, which happened almost two decades ago. And while there are probably different opinions about the California regulation, just as there were for the wind mitigation in Florida, we should all agree that an informed consumer is the best weapon against fire loss or really any loss. As true with any risk, the more consumer understands any particular risk and can turn that understanding into action, we can improve outcomes. The AAIS Consumer Notice Tool has been created to help our industry present a standardized, consistent, and easy to understand consumer notice. Moving on to the regulation. In October of 2022, uh, the California DOI passed the regulation requiring an insurer to offer specific mitigation factors. The determination of whether this applied to you currently, to your currently filed rate, was whether you used a wildfire risk model or a rating plan was segmented or differentiated a policyholder's rate based upon the policyholder's wildfire risk. Um, that for AIS, the changes we made were based upon that evaluation, especially around whether the loss, uh, the loss cost had any rate differential for the, for the wildfire risk. The specifics around the regulation are outlined here in this slide. The regulation addressed two types of mandatory mitigation factors, as well as the community level and property level uh, mandatory mitigation factors. The property level factors cover mitigation measures addressing both the immediate surroundings of the structure, often referred to as defensible space, as well as the building's hardening measures performed on the structure itself. The regulation further identifies some op optional factors <clears throat> relating to wildfire loss that an insurer may incorporate into the rating plans as long as they, res they as the resulting rate are not ex excessive, inadequate, or unfairly discriminatory. My colleagues will cover both of the AAIS application of these credits in the AAIS programs, as well as the importance of the information for the consumer through our consumer notice tool. And you will see this information presented again throughout the webinar. Throughout the regulation, there are administrative requirements that an insurer must follow. The overview of the California regulation highlights some of the major requirements an insurer must follow to ensure compliance. Each company is still required to make a filing, even if your advisory organization has filed with the department. As for AIS, as an advisory organization, we have filed with the department and our filings are currently under review. And shout out and thank you to the California department, some of those who are on this call today, for all your work on this. Many of the requirements um, are around transparency and providing information regarding the mitigation credits to your policyholders. 
The information presented is not meant to be comprehensive review. The regulation is really intended to summarize the information to help you prepare you for the information you're about to see presented by my colleagues. In addition, the AIS team is also monitoring active legislation and or regulation in other states that are considering similar types of mitigation credits. The team regularly sends alerts, notices, and bulletins regarding compliance items like the mitigation credits. So please sign up for our member alerts if you aren't already receiving this information. Now I'd like to pass the next part of today's conversation to Linda Jancic, a product manager of personal lines for AEIS to speak to the pro product perspective. Linda, take it away. Thanks, Robin. We will focus on homeowners by peril and homeowners composite as they were affected the most. Legislation impacted several AAS programs, however. So please note that these filings shown for these programs have not yet been approved. So once approved, bulletins will be released with pertinent information, such as any changes to the filing. So looking at the center of the slide under agricultural output, and as, as Robin said, I'm the personal lines product manager, but just to talk a little bit about the other programs. So for agricultural output and commercial output, climatical hazards referenced in the deficiency point rating, and these deficiency points allow for premium surcharges due to wildfire should it be considered a climatical hazard. So filings were done for agricultural output and commercial output to reflect wildfire mitigation measures and deficiency point selection. So I do have the bulletins here if for additional information. And also Casey Davis is the, uh, the farm product manager and Stephanie Vasey for Commercial Output and Inland Marine Guide. And so for Inland Marine, there are additional terminal modifications and then disaster exposure considerations are in, uh, included brush fire. So there was a filing done to exclude wildfire risk from consideration. So now focusing on the impact for homeowner by peril and the HOC programs, Wildfire risk mitigation credits are available in both California homeowners programs in the rule manual. So for HOBP, it's rule 612 and HOC, it's rule 616. And the reason is there's different ways of premium determination for these two programs because in HOBP, wildfire can be isolated, whereas in homeowner composite, there are combined loss costs that do not allow it to split up into individual programs. So um, on to the next slide. Thank you. So as Robin indicated, we are outlining how the program AES developed works, what it considers and what it does not. So there are three categories of wildfire risk mitigation credits available. There's community coordination, there's property hardening and there's defensible space. So I will cover each one. So whereas the community coordination credit applies to the community you live in, property hardening measures, as well as defensible space measures, can be influenced by the policyholder. So we can't suppress our way out of wildfire, but the answer is mitigation that's consistent and coordinated. So for the, the wildfire risk to an individual property can be significantly impacted by the property and areas around it that are often beyond the control of the individual property owner. So communities that are coordinated collaborative and consistent in their wildfire mitigation efforts are likely to have lower losses and better outcomes. So in alignment with the CDI regulation, AS program recognizes two programs shown here, Firewise USA Communities in Good Standing and the Fire Risk Reduction Communities as identified by CAL FIRE. So next for property hardening, these measures relate to all building characteristics that help to reduce wildfire risk. These include the following measures shown above, and Robin talked about them as well, the Class A rated roof, enclosed eaves, fire resistant vents, multi-pane windows, and six inches of non-combustible vertical clearance. And then next for defense, defensible space, the risk of wildfire damage to buildings is are dependent on preventative measures, such as ensuring that the area surrounding the building is clear of excessive flammable material and debris. Risk mitigation factors, as shown here, include uh, clearing vegetation or debris under decks, clearing of combustible vegetation or mulch within five feet, removal of structures or sheds within 30 feet, 
compliance with public resources code PRC 4291 and our local ordinances on dispensable space. So next, uh, compounding impact or CI, the more risk mitigation factors you apply, the more effective risk mitigation will be. So to encourage this, there is a compounding impact bonus credit. For each property hardening and defensible space, there's a 1% credit up to 5% each. Then once you have three or more risk mitigation measures, property hardening and defensible space, a policyholder can obtain additional compounding credits for three or more mitigations. So for example, say you do four property hardening pieces, you would get 1% for each of those or 4% plus that an additional 4%, that compounding impact for a uh, total of 8%. So as you can see here, the most for property hardening you can get is a 10%, 5% for each item, and then you get the compounding impact. And similarly for defensible space, it works the same way. So overall, if you did each of these things, you could have a total of 20%. So next, regarding uh, independent validation. So to make sure the risk mitigation measures are working properly and maintained, a regular validation is necessary. For defensible space risk mitigation measures, AS suggests a yearly evaluation by an external party, whereas for property hardening measures, a three-year validation period is recommended. As you can see here, there are several providers that can do a validation of the applied risk mitigation measures. And for example, you can see the California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection, um, qualified entities licensed or approved by CAL FIRE under Senate Bill 63, evaluators approved by the Institute for Business and Home Safety, IBHS. Um, each carrier can therefore decide which third-party evaluators are acceptable to them. Next. Please note from the previous slide, you might have noticed the IBHS um, have inc included personnel trained and certified as part of their wildfire prepared home program. That's one of the ways a carrier can validate that the mitigation efforts were completed satisfactorily. So this may raise a question, does this program give specific or additional credits for properties that have been validated to comply with the wildfire prepared home or wildfire prepared home plus designation? So in short, no, we do not include additional credits. However, the wildfire prepared home is likely one of the easiest and best ways a homeowner can provide independent validation that they have met most, if not all of the home hardening and defensible space requirements, and this will maximize their mitigation credits. So while it's possible for the homeowner to get validation that each of these mitigations was successfully completed separately, it may be time consuming and challenging to do so. So it's anticipated that many homeowners will choose this route. But to avoid double dipping or any other potential sources of confusion, AS does not offer separate credit for wildfire prepared homes or wildfire prepared home plus. So this slide does display a crosswalk that outlines how these two programs map onto the included mitigation credits. You'll notice that there is an asterisk in that first column for removal or absence of combustible structures within 30 feet. This is a variation in the distance that is allowable in the wildfire prepared home versus what is included in the AES program. It is incumbent on the carrier to determine whether the property qualifies for this credit in addition to the wildfire prepared home. The wildfire prepared home only allows within 15 feet, so it's uh, more strict than the AAIS 30 feet. Next, I'll transition to Mike Payne, AAS Chief Actuary, for more about the proposed homeowner credits with sample premium calculation. Great. Thank you, Linda. I appreciate it. Uh, happy to be here to walk through the numbers side of things. Um, so the proposed available credits, um, just kind of reiterating that these have been filed with the department, uh, but they have not yet been approved. They're still under review. Um, so everything from here, uh, just keep that in mind. Uh, I'll try and keep using the term proposed as that's what they are at this point. Um, but uh, here we got the three categories of community coordination, property hardening, and defensible space. So at the top, uh, with the community coordination, um, we are proposing a 4% wildfire credit for being recognized in a Firewise USA site in good standing. Um, this 4% is larger than most of our other credits. Um, we wanted to recognize that it's um, 
they have a lot of activities going on. They're really committed. Um, they have uh, education campaigns and things. So it was a little bit more robust and we wanted to reflect that for being recognized uh, in a California fire risk reduction community. Uh, we are proposing a 1% credit for this. Uh, it's a relatively new program. And so that's why it's a little bit different than the FireWise USA site. Um, but these two pieces are technically mutually exclusive. So you could be in one or both of those types of communities. Um, so you could have the 4% plus the 1%. Um, at this point, these credits are, are additive. Um, so your maximum wildfire credit for community coordination would be 5%. And it's more important to note the maximum credits. That is a piece of the legislation and the consumer notice, um, as you'll see later on. But um, that's something that uh, a piece of information that needs to go out to the insureds um, uh, to know how much credit they could receive on their bill should they get all of these uh, mitigation activities or characteristics. So moving on to the property hardening, uh, you'll see the five uh, items listed there. Don't need to go through them. We're proposing a 1% credit for each of them. Uh, it might seem small, or um, we're kind of starting judgmentally, uh, but again, as Linda had talked about the compounding impact, we really wanted to try and emphasize the fact that when you do more and more of these, um, they add up and you'll get more and more of a benefit. And so here, with the five individual ones, if you um, did uh, your property did meet all five of them, you would have the 5% for each of them plus the 5% in total, leading to a total maximum wildfire credit of 10% for the property hardening. Uh, the same thing applies for the defensible space. So again, you have five uh, activities. Assuming all five are met, you would get the 5% um, compounding impact, and you add those together to get a total of 10% for a maximum wildfire credit for defensible spaces. So again, at this point, they are all additive. So if you add up those three components together, uh, we are proposing a maximum of a 25% credit um, to the wildfire portion of the lost costs. Okay. All right, next slide. So here we're talking about the premium determination. Uh, again, this is what we proposed. Um, we're going to really target the two homeowners programs that we have, homeowners by apparel and homeowners composite. And for those of you not familiar with our program, uh, as you can imagine, the homeowners by apparel is separated by each um, apparel. We have 10 of them. One of them is wildfire. It stands alone. And then for composite, all perils are kind of combined together into an aggregate uh, loss cost. And so there's a slight difference in how we would be applying the premium determination. But step one, regardless, is to determine the applicable wildfire risk mitigation credits, as, as we discussed. Um, step two is really only for composite. And that's where we're trying to adjust those percentages, those credits, to basically reflect the fact that it's applied to a composite loss cost as opposed to just specifically wildfire. Um, so step three. Uh, for homeowners by apparel, we're basically taking all those applicable uh, credits and subtracting them from 1.0, and that determines a factor. And I'll get into a couple of examples later, but here are the words that basically uh, step through it. And then for composite, uh, we take that um, composite credit and subtract that from a 1.0 to get that final factor. And in each instance, uh, we'll be taking that final factor and multiplying it by the loss cost that's already been calculated. Um, so for homeowners, it's you multiply that factor towards the peril G, which is our wildfire uh, final uh, loss cost. And then for composite, it gets applied to the composite loss cost that's already been calculated. And just a little side note here for uh, the COP and AGOP programs, they use deficiency points ratings, and Linda had mentioned this earlier. Um, but we just wanted to have that incorporated should the, those uh, deficiency points, those considerations can uh, include wild, uh, wildfire risk as well. All right, so get into some numbers a little bit. Here's an example of homeowners by apparel, again, filed but not yet approved. Um, our program, again, is made up of these individual perils. So the wildfire apparel uh, reflected on the far left and the other nine perils uh, in those blue columns. And they basically just add up across the board to get your final total policy uh, loss cost. So in this example, um, each of the peril loss costs are listed. So we're assuming wildfire is $250. Um, the other perils as shown, and they add up to $1,000 for the entire policy. So that's our starting point. Um, mm -hmm. Now, assuming this particular property or this risk had uh, 20 points of, of those credits, 
So perhaps they did everything they possibly could to the property. They got all of the property hardening and they got all the defensible space, but they don't happen to be in those either of those two communities. They um, would receive that 20 uh, points of a credit. Um, for the other perils, they show up as zero because they would not apply. So once you've had that point two, uh, we're following the steps and you subtract those applicable factors from 1.0. And this gets you that final factor. So for wildfire peril, one minus the point two gets you the point eight. And again, for the other perils, there's nothing to subtract. So you're left with a 1.0 factor. And the final step really is taking your initial loss cost uh, times the factor that you have gotten for the wildfire mitigation. And for the wildfire peril, you start with a $250, you multiply it by the 0.8 and you're left with a net $200 loss cost. Now switching to the other perils, those are 1.0s, so it's the same loss cost and, the, and there's no change. Um, but similarly, you just add up those loss costs by those perils and you get the $950 total loss cost for the policy and the wildfire uh, risk mitigation credit in terms of dollar amounts shows up as the $50 in total. So moving to composite, uh, again, another sample calculation. So similarly, uh, you still have a wildfire component to the overall composite loss cost, although it's just kind of lost in the shuffle. It's all thrown in together. So if we start off with the same type of policy and it's a $1,000 base loss cost. Click the next button. All right, there it is. Uh, so assuming it's a $1,000 composite and assuming it's it gets the same uh, 0.2 uh, some of the credits. Uh, this is that extra step that needs to get applied to composite. So we take that 0.2 and we're going to multiply it by a separate factor. We're calling it this composite um, adjustment factor. In this case, 0 0.250. So we take the 0.25, multiply it by the 0.2 to get a 0.05. Um, so this step is really needed because it's accounting for the fact that our adjustment, that, that credit, um, is being applied to the composite, which includes non-fire wild uh, non-wildfire risk. So you wouldn't necessarily think that um, you know um, tornado hail damage should not really be impacted by the wildfire risk mitigation efforts. So we're trying to dampen that factor down. Uh, the 0.25 comes from uh, on average wildfire risk makes up about 25% of the composite loss costs. So it's bringing it down by that amount. So we're left with a 0.05. And now we subtract that from a 1.0 uh, and we're left with a 0.95 final factor. And just like with HOVP, we take that final factor and multiply it by our composite loss cost. And we effectively get the same final um, loss cost of $950 and the same wildfire risk mitigation credit of $50. So that makes up the number side of things. Hopefully the illustrations help to understand, help you understand what we we're proposing and, and how our, our steps uh, function within our two uh, homeowners programs. And uh, now I would like to pass it over to Matt Heinz Aldrich. He is our senior risk strategy lead for AAS. Matt. Perfect, thanks Mike. Um, so uh, uh, as, we, as we talk about uh, um, as we talk about wildfire mitigation, that really the, the, the key, the, the crux of this, and as Robin alluded to in the beginning, is really getting homeowners and other property owners to take wildfire mitigation seriously. This isn't something that uh, um, we're not, we're not going to be able to suppress our way out of the wildfire problem. We're also not going to, um, this is not something that the fire departments themselves, uh, whether they be local uh, uh, in the local response areas or the state re responsibility areas, um, this, this is not something the fire departments themselves can, can address. We really need to get homeowners in, uh, involved in this. And so, uh, uh, and so as, we, um, as we look at this, one of the, uh, the key factors that comes in is how are, are, do we actually incentivize um, homeowners to take, uh, to take action? Obviously, uh, those that have experienced wildfire losses, either to themselves or, or perhaps neighbors or, or, or close uh, relatives, they obviously are very sensitive of uh, the importance of wildfire mitigation, but unfortunately, there's still a substantial number of people who uh, uh, who have not actually uh, uh, taken this seriously. Uh, and so, uh, the, the regulation uh, that's been put uh, forth by CDI goes a long way to start driving um, uh, start driving change and start driving uh, um, homeowner behavior. 
But there's another part to this where we really need to um, get uh, instill a sense of urgency. And so as we were uh, going through this regulation and uh, trying to uh, make sure, for one, we're being compliant with all the parts of it and, and also um, kind of thinking more importantly about how this actually impacts uh, and hopefully drives down losses, one of the things we started realizing is actually the importance of the consumer notice. The consumer notice is probably the least um, um, thought about and kind of the, uh, perhaps even an afterthought in a lot of this uh, regulation is that uh, uh, there's lots of focus on kind of the, uh, the actuarial analyses and the uh, and some of the calculations and, and being compliant with the law. And, and but part of that uh, compliance actually is uh, and it clarified that you uh, that carriers are, are required to make um, certain disclosures and certain um, statements to their insurers to make sure that they have information relative to their policy and, and what uh, credits they had available. But what we started to realize is that there's a real potentially missed opportunity here. And so we spent a, a fair bit of time actually developing a uh, um, uh, a kind of a model um, consumer notice. And so we we took this a step further than, uh, than just creating something and, and putting it in a uh, program and putting it in a filing. We actually tried to try to uh, take a step back and say, what information will actually, uh, if it was provided to uh, to insurers, would actually hopefully motivate them to uh, uh, to action. And so, in doing so, we identified that there was three uh, key issues that we need to address. Uh, those are um, issues around comprehension. We need to give some consideration to. We also need to give some thought to uh, accessibility. Uh, and, and finally, we also need to address uh, uh, some of the motivation aspects. So I'm going to get a little bit into that in each of those. Um, and so one of the uh, one of the, the fundamental things we identified very early on is that uh, uh, we need to ensure that that actually consumers can fully understand and and, and appreciate and learn and and actually and then more importantly change their behavior based on this notice. And so in doing so. Um, <clears throat> There, uh, it really drove home the point that we actually need to make sure that uh, um, that we focus on comprehension. And in fact, actually, there's a lot of lessons to be learned from the marketing world in this. That uh, um, the marketers have long figured out that if you want to get uh, uh, consumers, in their case, people who they want to buy their products, um, to to take action, that they need to again make sure that information is accessible. And so, what they've uh, sort of identified, and it may be sort of um, perhaps unfortunate or uh, um, or um, or, or kind of a, uh, um, can, you can read into this a bit more that, uh, um, that the, the level of reading comprehension across the country and across uh, California specifically is, is uh, um, you know, is, is quite a wide variety. And so the marketers have identified and they, there's kind of a colloquial phrase that they use of uh, think like a marketer, write like an eighth grader. And so there's a, uh, um, there's a real emphasis in terms of making sure that the um, material that is actually uh, provide the notices that are actually accessible. And so in doing so, <clears throat> pardon me, we use tools like, uh, um, there's a, uh, tools like Hemingway and others, uh, uh, tools that can help you uh, refine, uh, refine language and also uh, um, give some thought to more succinct or, or more clear ways to write things that hopefully will be more comprehensible, understandable, and interpretable for the widest po possible audience. Mm -hmm. And so in doing so, obviously, there's a lot of uh, compliance issues around that uh, we have to make there's certain certain legal terms that we have to uh, uh, be clear about and, and certain very uh, defined legal definitions that we have to give. And, and so sometimes there's not always possible to um, to address everything. But it, uh, to the extent possible, this was we put a lot of thought into this. Another thing we identified is actually uh, uh, around accessibility and and when we're talking about accessibility in terms of consumer notices, one of the things we identified is that actually um, data visualizations are a really powerful tool and actually, frankly, a, a quite succinct way to convey information. However, um, in many cases, they rely upon um, very like varying colors and uh, in doing so uh, can actually be uh, more challenging for people with various types of, of color blindness or other visual impairments. Um, and so, uh, and so we actually used a tool called Cobolus um, that helps identify, um, uh, looks like it basically will take an image and will identify um, color tones and other color saturations that may be challenging with the various different uh, types of color blindness. I'll, I'll, I'll be candid, this was actually a real learning experience for me because I didn't know all the various different types of color blindness that 
uh, that people experience. And so, uh, um, and so we're able to modify some of the, um, uh, this, this tool that we'll share here in a second um, and, and try to make sure that it is interpretable, again, um, to the widest uh, group possible. And then the final, um, final topic I wanted to uh, uh, talk about is really, again, this the driving um, point that we really want to focus on motivation. And that uh, uh, that the the goal of the consumer notice is is partially uh, for uh, there's this course we, we want to make sure that we're focusing on transparency and and uh, we're meeting all the uh, compliance issues that are required and there are certainly uh, in this legislation or this regulation uh, in particular but all, in all regulation there are a lot of uh, legal compliance uh, matters and topics and, and other um, um, items that have to be included. Uh, to be compliant with the law, <clears throat> and so uh, and so that is, of course, uh, was one of our uh, primary um, goals and primary um, things that we um, kind of consider uh, focused on. But in doing so, sometimes you get uh, um, it, it can tend to uh, um, move to more towards uh, what is sometimes referred to as the fine print or the the, the part where it gets really into uh, again what sometimes is disparagingly referred to as legal ease. But all that is is just all those kind of those popular phrases are really just highlighting that uh, um, that people perhaps are not reading them or are not actually using the information to make uh, informed decisions. And so we really focused on uh, trying to make sure that the information is conveyed in such a way that encourages them. And there's a lot uh, of insights that we uh, derive from the field of, of, of uh, behavioral economics. And uh, that's a really emerging area of trying to how do you try to uh, drive um, beneficial behavior and socially beneficial behavior through uh, by changing um, how you frame topics and the way you talk about things? And so we really tried to focus on um, on on really how do uh, how could a consumer um, um, take this information and actually act, act upon it? The other thing that brings this that also brings up, and this is part of the reason we refer to this as a model um, as a model form, is that. Uh, the challenge is, is that if if uh, uh, various carriers all have pr produced different types of notices to their insureds, it makes it very difficult. So, for example, if I received a notice from my in insurer and my neighbor received a, a notice from uh, from their insurer, and then we tried to compare notes and say, well, well I got this information from my insurer and, and you got this information from your insurer, how does that translate? What is that like? Uh, if if all the information is vastly different, is, if it's hard to interpret from one to another, it makes it much more difficult for consumers to figure out what they should be doing, what they should be focusing on. And, and again, it really takes away from this idea of, of really spurring motivation. And so, um, <clears throat> and so this is really the, uh, uh, this is a, a sample um, of what we created with this, uh, 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 with this notice. We tried to keep it to two pages. So basically front and back of one, uh, one sheet. Um, again, the, the purpose being is that uh, we were hoping that uh, um, if we can make this short, succinct, and uh, and uh, relevant, that homeowners will actually take adv full advantage of it. If if this was spread across ten or fifteen pages, and there's lots of tables and lots of hard information to to gather, we anticipate that that was going to actually have a negative impact on actually again spurring behavior uh, spurring behavior change. And so, um, and this is all basically, this is all an Excel spreadsheet based tool. Um, and I'll show some screenshots of it here in a second. But this is basically these, in fact, these are uh, screenshots of the PDFs that it creates. Uh, and this can be either, uh, uh, can be manually, uh, all the information can be manually input through some um, drop down menus that I'll show again in a second. Or this can be done in an automated fashion at scale. And, uh, and basically, uh, you can, uh, you can, if you auto populate, if you populate uh, um, some of the uh, uh, this tool, uh, you can basically print out or, or auto generate uh, um, thousands of PDF notices in in a very short period of time. Um, and and as you see, a lot of these fields um, are designed to pull from uh, uh, pull from this tool. And so uh, um, and and all the um, all the uh, um, the speedometer charts, all of these are fully automated. So uh, whatever the rating is or whatever the information and the, the variables that are selected or were identified, it will change the charts. And it will also um, change all the information about the discounts and, and the, the discount, the award, like the amount that was awarded for in terms of the discount and also the amount that was possible is all, all automated based on 
uh, the calculation is pulling from whatever the loss cost for that particular uh, community or, or what have you. The other part no worth noting here is base, since this is an Excel spreadsheet based tool, this we intended this to be entirely customizable by any of our members. And so uh, we've developed this to, to try to automate this as much as possible, but everything of it can be changed. The, uh, I mean, everything from the colors to the, the verbiage, if it, again, um, recognizing that, um, that the carriers are gonna to have to make their own choices and there may be, they may make some choices and, and make some variations when they do their own filing. And so this is entirely um, customizable uh, and relatively easily so. Um, and again, uh, so the, the first page is most of the illustration or most of the visualizations. The second page is most of kind of the information. We did per, uh, identify uh, three resources that are the most perhaps useful for um, for insureds to uh, to reference if they're trying to understand what they can do. And so uh, we point them to the CDI's website uh, on uh, wildfire recovery. There's a a, a a a document that was created in in partnership with uh, I believe it was the University of of Nevada uh, and in partnership with some other um, entities in, in California. That's really a great resource there. And then finally, the uh, wildfire risk to communities resource, free resource that is developed by the Forest Service. And all those links are available in that QR code, which uh, we will share again later. Um, and so uh, uh, and then you'll see all the kind of the legal uh, legal notices around appeals and all the other uh, requisite information as part of their compliance. And then finally, some of the definitions uh, uh, that apply. So um, this is a, a screenshot of what it actually looks like uh, from the Excel, Excel uh, spreadsheet tool. And so uh, again, uh, all the stuff on the left-hand side can be uh, adapted, uh, relative, again, relatively easily. Colors can be changed. All the conditional formatting can be changed. On the right-hand side, there is uh, uh, you can either manually import uh, input all the information. So if you have if a, a carrier had a small number of clients that they were producing these for, they could manually uh, each one of those is a drop-down menu, and they could change the uh, um, the the yes or no's. Um, <clears throat> somewhat hidden there is actually a hidden um, column is the ability to to switch to an automated. Um, um, an automated version, and that will actually then pull from a, um, a batch entry uh, where you can uh, you can put your entire book of business basically, and you can um, do all that uh, do all the calculations or all the other information at scale, um, and then automate that whole process. And then here's the second page of this. So this is basically just the lower half of the same Excel spreadsheet, and again, all the consumer notices and legal requirements can be adapted. Um, and then, uh, um, and then you see that again. More; those are more variables that can be either manually or, or automatically uh, entered. So, one of the other variations uh, we recognize that again with the legislation, there was uh, discussion about whether you whether your uh, company uses um, cat, uh, catastrophic wildfire risk models. And if if there were uh, if the, if a company did use those, there was a requirement to disclose the model that was used how it operates, and uh, there's a lot of other um, transparency disclosures, um, and also that you had to give, uh, had to clarify to the insured what their, uh, what the risk score that was, uh, was, and what the, the like, what the range was. Um, and, uh, uh, and so we've off, we've created a separate version. It's all in the same, as you can see in the very bottom, uh, this, this version of the screenshot shows you all the, the, the tables there, or the um, worksheets there. And so, um, uh, so this we have a separate version. Again, this can be all customized, uh, and it also will pull in. Um, you can either automate or you can uh, uh, make any changes there as you see fit. Uh, and of course, as uh, if if companies do uh, use the cap wildfire risk models, of course, as you go through your own um, compliance filings, you'll need to uh, make sure that again this meets all the requisite information. And a key part of that is, uh, is for, and again, really the focus here is trying to um, uh, try to succinctly capture the most important information that can help a insured understand how, you, uh, obviously, how the, uh, um, the, the carrier determine the information, but also to understand in a really um, um, easy to interpret um, description as opposed to some of the very complex uh, um, discussions of, of how the like the, the real complexity around some of the models. 
but again, this is uh, so we made this available. So if carriers are are uh, are planning to or to, to adopt this or plan to use wildfire models, uh, you can choose either of the two options, and again, adapt easily as as you see fit. And so, uh, um, and so. Um, um, there we go. So, and here is the that section of it uh, in a bit more detail. Um, if you if you couldn't see it very before. Um, so next, I'm going to uh, uh, share. So this is actually a very um, simple um, or a very a very short video, uh, just a screen capture of how the automated process works. So let me just uh, quickly run this. So this shows that basically uh, we've we've set it so it will, it pulls from a number of. Uh, um, it was basically going through the automated batch list of all like a, an entire uh, a company's um, uh, basically a simulated version of a company's book of business and 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 basically then can turn and then can basically print all of those as PDFs um, and so uh, again we we did this and and we created this in such a way that hopefully it should make it much easier for carriers to. Um, uh, to to handle the, the scaling up of this uh, process of creating these notices. And again, uh, we created this uh, finally just uh, uh, to kind of wrap this part up. We, we created this in such a way um, that we hope this can become a model that uh, uh, and hopefully may become a model that uh, is adopted across the industry. And uh, um, and, and and like uh, we've this, this is not we've not created this as a proprietary tool. We intend this to be. Uh, um, I hopefully will be uh, widely used. And really, hopefully we drive home this point that uh, the, uh, we really need to focus on the consumer notice as a key part of, of, um, of actually changing um, consumer behavior. And so uh, um, and so happy to, uh, um, to, to share this and happy to uh, answer any questions, which uh, uh, is a good segue because uh, um, there, there we go. So, um, so just to wrap up, uh, a couple kind of topics that we wanted to cover today. So we've shared a little bit about our um, the regulation and how we uh, have answered it. Uh, we tried to stay as as close and as uh, uh, as as uh, uh, consistent with the regulation to try to make it as easy for carriers and for insurers um, and to speed the adoption and to really change uh, um, again change consumer behavior. And so. Uh, um, uh, that is, uh, as we've noted several times, that has been filed and, and we're still waiting uh, for approval. And once that is, uh, once we do have the approval, uh, we will uh, be putting out approval bulletins uh, to our members. And so, uh, um, but, but uh, like we will uh, uh, be, be providing a lot of more information once we have all that, uh, um, uh, once the approvals have come through. Um, other information I wanted to kind of uh, uh, drive home is that uh, uh, we've also developed something called the Wildfire Resource Center. This is a free tool. Uh, it uses something called Esri um, Story Maps. And it's basically it's an a educational resource for uh, for people um, who are um, trying to basically learn the um, kind of soup to nuts about uh, the wildfire peril and, and wildfires in, in, in general. It's a quite detailed uh, educational resource. Again, we created it uh, for free. Um, it, you can find it at the, um, at the uh, QR code there. Uh, you'll also notice that uh, this is actually the same QR code that is linked uh, in the consumer notice. The reason we did that is actually um, to, to address the potential uh, breaking, of, uh, um, uh, breaking of links or any other challenges in terms of getting consumers to actually type um, the right URL, it, we figured it was actually easier. So we just put all the links to those uh, those three resources that we referred to, the CDI website, uh, the um, home retrofit what, re website, and the uh, forest service one. Um, all of those are available there uh, and, and be much easier for consumers. And then as we mentioned, uh, the consumer template, we're happy to share that. And, and it is in the uh, in a spreadsheet uh, form and uh, has some included VBA uh, to automate some of this work. So here's our information as well. Uh, please feel free to, uh, uh, to contact any of us. Um, and with that, I am going to, uh, uh, we're gonna, um, we have some time left, looks like, um, and hopefully left enough time to for Q&A. And so I'm gonna read the first one. Um, First one, are there uh, any consumer notice prototypes available for multi-location commercial risk versus homeowner policy types? Um, uh, Mike, is this one you can uh, uh, can take? 
Sure, I know. Sure. At this point in time, um, our focus was just on uh, the homeowners programs as that's what immediately impacted uh, AS programs at this point. Um, so for other options, uh, I would say that what, as Matt had mentioned, what we would be submitting um, for these notices could be customizable, um, kind of retrofitted, so to speak, for commercial properties, should that be um, something that some carriers would like to do. Uh, certainly, you'd have to make some adjustments for multi-properties as opposed to a single property, um, but that is not something we have tackled at this point. And I will take the next one as well. Looks like, oh, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, will the Excel template be password protected? And so would a user be able to make modifications as needed? Uh, it will not be password protected. Um, the worksheets themselves might be protected, but without a password. Uh, the protection really just uh, prevents people from, you know, uh, accidentally overwriting a cell with a formula in it or something like that. But those could certainly be unlocked. Um, and that's the whole point. Um, everything that carriers and members would want to put into the program still needs to be filed with California. So if this isn't included in that filing or they request an objection, something like that, you'd have to make sure that it complies with the program that you would be filing, whether that's an AAS program or something customized on your end. Yep. And so, uh, um, so another question came in, uh, does this apply to uh, excess and surplus lines uh, and, and uh, non-admitted carriers? Who, uh, uh, Robin, do you want to take that? Uh, sure. Um, if you are a, if you file, if you generally file a rate filing with the California Department, you are under this regulation. Yeah, I think uh, um, I, maybe um, with the question uh, question asker, I'm not sure if you're referring to um, the the regulation or or any of the other parts, but, uh, um, but, uh, um, but yeah, so the first protocol would probably be the CDI uh, if it's around the regulation. Um, in, in terms of like, uh, in terms of if you wanted to know uh, um, if you could use the consumer notice for uh, in the extra surplus lines, sure. Mm -hmm. uh, again, like I said, we've, uh, we've designed this to be non-proprietary and uh, hopefully, um, I mean, in a, in a great world, uh, maybe this becomes a model that gets adopted um, across the industry. But uh, uh, so, yes, so that part would certainly be uh, um, accessible. So another question came in um, around cat models and risk scores. What are the differences? Hmm. As a, I can take a, <laughs> an attempt at that one. <laughs> um, so catastrophe models, um, those would be you know third party vendors and they take information characteristics about particular exposures, um, the property characteristics. Some of them might include some of these mitigation efforts, uh, depending on which one you'd be utilizing, as well as aspects of the coverage for that particular property. And ultimately they, they spit up some characteristics of um, expected losses for that property going forward. Um, and so risk scores would be more of a way to to um, kind of differentiate, are you high up, high risk or low risk? Um, some of those risk scores could depend and be informed by catastrophe models. Um, so it kind of depends on how the member actually utilizes catastrophe models, whether they're just used for um, developing a loss cost or whether they're used to develop some sort of rating factor, adjustment factor, or if they're used in the individual underwriting of a particular property. Um, the risk score I think is meant to be a little bit more generic um, to provide other ways of differentiating those risks would make perhaps not using a catastrophe model itself. Hopefully that helps. So, um, so how much does this, that does a certain mitigation cost and what are the likely uh, reductions in, in claims costs? So, um, so I'll, I'll handle the first half of that. So there's wide variety in terms of how much mitigations cost. Um, there, there's been actually a fair bit of uh, research and in, in other resources that, and other uh, um, estimates that have been um, um, that have been or that are out there and available. So, for example, there's a group out of uh, I believe they're out of, of Montana, but called Headwater Economics. Um, they've done a, a quite a lot of research in terms of trying to estimate uh, um, 
the uh, uh, the cost of a very uh, uh, various different types of uh, um, a wildfire mitigation that are included. Um, and so, for example, um, retrofitting a home to multi-pane windows, if you only currently have single-pane windows, that can be relatively expensive. Um, on the other hand, um, installing uh, um, in installing fire resistant vents me, can actually be potentially uh, very inexpensive, and also um, um, in many cases, actually uh, depending on, of course, on the the skill sets and abilities of the, uh, the the property owner, it may be something that a, a homeowner can do themselves in a kind of more of a DIY fashion. Um, and of course, there are uh, you, yeah, there's some specific requirements in order to be uh, um, uh, fire resistive, uh, but uh, uh, but there are, so there's quite a wide variety. So um, it could be, I mean, some of the mitigations um, could be in the you know a couple hundred dollars, um, and sometimes it's, it's sometimes it's frankly just labor um, and labor uh, costs. Uh, on the other hand, some of them uh, could be quite expensive, uh, and so. Uh, um, uh, and so the, there's there's quite a wide variety, and there's also this as this becomes more common. Just to wrap, wrap this point up, uh, as this becomes more common, um, hopefully we'll start seeing, and as things like wildfire prepared home gets more well adopted, uh, hopefully we'll actually start seeing um, builders that are actually making these changes on the front end, and um, and so uh, as we already are seeing, and of course as as some of the wildfire and the WUI codes get more uh, more stringent. Um, that is actually starting to impact how um, the built environment is. And so hopefully more modern buildings are more wildfire resistant. Of course, there's some certainly some legacy ones. Um, now, any, anyone want to uh, take the, uh, um, what's the likely reduction in claims cost? Mm -hmm. I think that's pretty nebulous. Pretty, yeah, pretty, yeah that's, that's a difficult one to answer, absolutely. But I think it's a great question because it highlights the demand for more data. Right. Um, a lot of the things we talked about are judgmental. And and with this legislation, it's getting the conversation started, getting homeowners more aware. Hey, let's let's think about this as a real risk and what can we do about it? Um, but at the same time, the carriers, as they're starting to determine who is going to get these credits and who doesn't, we need to start collecting that data. Um, and especially as an advisor organization, the more members that are going to be tracking this and will be looking to um hopefully collect this data, we can provide a much better answer to that question specifically, whether it's, you know, the, all, all of the uh, mitigation activities combined or individual ones, um, we're looking to collect that. And eventually, once we get enough data, provide some sort of insights into that. Which is uh, a moment for us to put a shameless plug in around OpenIDL. Um, as you, if you haven't heard us before, we are very dedicated to looking at the technology of blockchain to help us to gather, collect this type of information, not just for regulatory reporting purposes, but for also making some impact into things like mitigation and how it actually uh, um, comes out on the other end. What, what, what are we, um, how are we helping consumers? What, what impact is this having? Um, so please, if you have never heard us speak about that, um, you're welcome to give us a call. There's a lot of information at openidl.org, which is a Linux Foundation project around using blockchain technology to actually collect data like uh, wildfire mitigation um, effect. Yeah, and I'll just, uh, before I segue into the next question, I'll just add that, uh, that um, like the consumer notice, uh, that the um, OpenIDL is, is non-proprietary and it's open source. And so we really are, as an organization, are committed to, uh, to taking that type of approach. And, and, uh, um, and so, um, but to, to one of the other questions that came in was, how does a homeowner get uh, certified by IBHS for the Wildfire Prepared Home Program? And who does that? So um, obviously that, that question is, should be directed to uh, uh, IBHS, uh, I believe is wildfireprepared.org, I believe is their website. Uh, uh, I should, it was on the, is in fact, it's on the notice, so I should uh, go back to the notice to, to remind myself. Um, but, uh, um, but this is a, a relatively new program uh, that is, uh, has, has uh, been recently kind of uh, um, um, been kind of brought online. And so they're bringing a lot of uh, 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 evaluators that now are certified to be able to do these inspections for them. And so, um, uh, but again, that's really, you should uh, check out the IBHS website. Uh, they've done some fantastic research and they're, uh, it's a really great resource uh, 
Um, so uh, definitely go, uh, check there first. Um, and so, uh, um, uh, so the next question that came in was, would AIS consider collecting and making available industry losses? This is similar to ISO fast track or ISO stat data, not just for wildfire, but across all perils. Uh, Robin, do you want to uh, take that one? Well, I'm, I'm going to start, but I'm going to let, I'm going to defer to Mike because he actually manages the statistical reporting at uh, um, AAIS. Um, AIS is a statistical reporter. We do have information um, that is contributed for the fast track data. Um, so yes, and Michael. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so yeah, we we do collect industry losses um, as as noted. We don't necessarily have the practice of taking that and you know selling it back to members that are interested in purchasing that, uh, but we do. Um, include that information in our filings, you know, depending on what programs we're talking about here. Um, and so as, as Robin had also mentioned, looking at open IDL, it's a different way to start sharing the information that we collect to the industry. Um, so at this point in time, it's not something we've been sharing, but it's something we are definitely open to in the future when the right uh, tools and systems are in place to ensure that that transparency does exist. And you know, this is the time and, and point in time that we would encourage, um, especially you know, our members, but also other uh, participants on the call to start thinking about whether or not you use a blockchain technology. What we do know is that a, stand, a data standard is very important for the collection of data and the ability of the insurance community as a whole to come together and decide what that data standard is, um, is very important. We also think that that should not be in a proprietary zone. In other words, we think that that development of the standard, which is also something we're doing over at OpenIDL, is something that the community should be able to tap into, to contribute to, and to be able to ask questions of through, through a technology source. So we would really encourage participation and development of data standards around the, the um, wildfire mitigation. Excellent. So I think we're uh, right at the top of the hour. Uh, so I, I want to thank my uh, fellow panelists, Robin, Mike, and Melinda. Uh, thank you for for joining this uh, call, and thank you everyone that's on the uh, that's joined us um, as attendees. And so, uh, um, if you missed any of the discussion, if you uh, uh, or if you want to watch a replay, uh, you can do so from our on-demand library at the AIS YouTube channel in the coming weeks. Uh, we also send a follow-up email uh, with all the, the panel's information that you see on your screen currently, um, as well as a link to the video recording. And so, as always, please feel free to, uh, to contact any of us and or uh, our engagement managers uh, with any questions you might have. And again, thank you for joining us, and uh, please enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thanks.